Welcome to the upstream of this panel. My name is Stormy Peters. Um, I lead a team of community managers within Red Hat. Um, and we have here today a group of experts on the open source software projects that make up all the things we've been talking about today. Um, but before I let them introduce themselves, I'd love to see how many people are familiar with the term upstream. How many people know what they're about to watch? So about half of you. So I want you to put your hand up again. Look around. If there's somebody whose hand is not up next to you, turn and tell them what upstream means to you. <laughs> so, so upstream, sorry. So you can also continue the conversation at lunch. Um, upstream to me means the open source software project that everyone contributes to. So a lot of times we say upstream first, which means make sure you contribute all the things that awesome things you've written to the open source software project so everybody can work together and collaborate. Um, it might mean something else to our panelists, so they can jump in if they want to. Um, but I'm going to have them introduce themselves so you can see their face, hear their voice, um, so that you can track them down at lunch or later this afternoon and ask them your question or tell them that idea that you had in response to theirs. So I'm going to have them one by one say their name, what they do, and then I've asked them to tell us what their favorite genre of books is and how that might relate to what we're talking about today. So pardon, I'm going to put you on the spot. All right. Um, yeah. Is this on? Yes, OK. Uh, I'm Aparna. Um, I lead product management for Kubernetes uh, and Google Container Engine at Google. Um, and let's see, what was the other question? Favorite genre. Favorite genre. Um, I would have to say that, well, I like Bollywood movies. I guess that's, that's one thing, which is maybe musicals. Um, but I also like documentaries and mostly um, fact-based and real stuff. And I think the connection to cloud native and open source is that with open source software, uh, you can really go in and you can look at the code, um, and it's what you see is what you get, which is very uh, refreshing and honest. Um, hi, I'm Brandon Phillips. I'm the CTO and co-founder of CoreOS. Uh, if you're not familiar with CoreOS, we've built a bunch of open source projects in the ecosystem, um, some of which are used by uh, Kubernetes, things like Flannel and etcd. And then we build a product called Tectonic, which is uh, secure, simple, and current Kubernetes um, that's built on pure upstream Kubernetes. Um, what uh, favorite genre? My favorite genre is sci-fi. Um, did you want to go into the questions about like how it relates? If, if you got a way that sure. that relates. Um, so the, the novel that I read um, most recently was uh, Dune. And... Um, I think I think that maps well to Kubernetes. Uh, it's a very <laughs> it's a very very resource constrained planet. Um, you have to be very careful with how you use resources, uh, which I think fits well with our, our scheduling model in Kubernetes. Hey, I'm Paul. Uh, I work on OpenShift, which I think most of you are have a passing familiarity with. Uh, let's say. Uh, I also like science fiction, which is probably not a shocker to anybody <laughs> that somebody on the stage would say that. Uh, I most recently have been reading the novels of Greg Egan, uh, and they're not necessarily about technology primarily. They're more about the, the human condition and the universe, uh, but they, as a plot point, tend to feature people who live their entire lives in software, like as sentient software. Uh, and this is incredible like super interesting to me to think about a software city running in a Kubernetes cluster, but it's also kind of terrifying because I'm like, is one of my bugs gonna kill a sentient piece of software in like 200 years? Because I don't think I'm gonna be debugging that. Hi, my name is Alexis Richardson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Weaveworks, and um, we make a bunch of open source projects which are used in the community fairly widely, probably best known for WeaveNet, which is an SDN, and for WeaveScope, which is a tool for visualizing your application and troubleshooting it. And more recently, WeaveFlux and Cortex. And all of these come together in our commercial product, WeaveCloud, which is a software as a service for operating clusters, be they Kubernetes or OpenShift or Docker or some weird combination of all three. And um, on the subject of genres, I guess um, I'm going to join the club here and uh, confess to liking sci-fi and fantasy. But when you think about 
you know, what is open source and OpenShift and Kubernetes most like? It's quite challenging because there are so many examples to pick from. I mean, we've had Dune already, and I think, is it like Game of Thrones, for example? <laughs> We have the CNCF board meeting this afternoon, which will be nothing like the Red Wedding, I promise you. Um, I read a really great book last year called The Goblin Emperor, which is about somebody who's thrust into a position of trying to manage an extremely complicated empire. And I think that is, in, and without having a single clue about what's going on, that's a pretty good analogy for running a software company. I definitely recommend that book. Thank you. Uh, my name is Clayton Coleman. I'm architect for OpenShift. Um, I also, I'm going to say, like sci-fi. So this is maybe a little bit along Paul's line of thought, but one of my favorite books is A Deepness in the Sky. And it's basically slower than light, giant, you know, interstellar spacecraft. But unlike, you know, the more positive and upbeat... IBM. Yeah, instead of, instead of being this like very bright, clean, futuristic spaceship, they're these giant spaceships that no one understands how they run because it's layer and layer and layer and layer of software <laughs> all the way up. It's abstractions all, it's turtles all the way down and abstractions all the way up. And so instead of being programmers, you're archaeologists and you dig through the different layers to go find the program that you can then adapt to go use because all software has been written. And so every time I think of that, I think of, I hope one day that I can aspire to be one of those low levels of that interstellar spaceship <laughs> and be somebody else's problem. That is awesome. Thanks for the analogies to books. Um, so after every question, I'm just gonna kind of look over the audience and if anyone raises their hand, like after a question, um, I'll take an audience question. If not, I'll just start the discussion up here. Um, so we have a bunch of users in the audience, um, and I think most of the developers and most of the companies working here are familiar with why we wo work upstream, why we work in open source. Um, and I think Aparna said, you know, Kubernetes should be the platform for the world. And what would you tell the users in the audience about what they should be doing to get the most out of their day when they have the developers here in the audience? Um, why is it important that it's open source, and what does that mean to them in their day? I didn't give them canned questions, by the way. Sorry, the question is, what, why is open source important to me? To, to the users. To the users. That are here. About a third of the audience, I think, from this morning. This is, is a question user. people ask every year and have been doing since 1991, and the answers change every year, which is a really interesting thing. Um, it used to be the case that people would say open source, uh, you know, you could see the bugs, and if there were issues with security, you could request for them to be fixed. And that was drawn as a contrast with companies like Microsoft, which at the time had a very hostile stance to open source and very much wouldn't admit to having any bugs, for example. You know, I think today open source is about participation. The idea that you can be empowered by a tool and you can help make it better is very powerful to users. Um, a lot of the people, you know, the idea that you are contributing, patching, getting involved on Slack, getting involved on GitHub, and that's part of your day-to-day -day work as a normal developer in a normal end-user company um, or startup or big company doing open source, I think is integral to open source today. And that's a huge change. That wasn't true 10 years ago. That was the exception. Um, so I think that's fantastic. Um, I, I think probably the other reason that people um, gravitate towards it is uh, in almost every organization that we work with, uh, there are constraints. Um, and those constraints generally mean that um, software engineers have to make the choice between um, going back to the vendor uh, of their software to uh, make the thing fit into their constraints or just looking at it, fixing it, and moving on with their day. Um, and I think I, as a software engineer myself, uh, I would much rather just fix something and move on than have to uh, work with another layer of management. So I think that's, <laughs> that's a big part of it. So for me, uh, I think that as a user, long-time user of open source software, it's important to me because I've like learned a lot as a developer by combing through open source code and especially now that you know it's really easy to just reach out to people that work on projects, you can learn directly from the people that wrote this stuff, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. The the world has gotten a lot smaller and uh, you know, now if you if you want a lesson in software engineering, you can go on Kubernetes Slack and say hello or OpenShift IRC and ask a question, learn something. And that also helps us as developers because the more you have to explain something, the more you really understand it. And the more questions you get about it, 
you tend to prepare more and, and do some deep learning in advance of those questions too. And I was gonna, I was gonna add to um, what Alexa said, which was there's a, like, we're, we're at the point where it used to be that it was an ideological thing to be an open source. You did it because you believe so strongly in the mission, but I think it's just part of what we do. Like the, I think someone's used the phrase citizen developer and I had no idea what that meant. But I think there's some element of like, we're all participating in making things that are useful to us. And as that web of software grows, it's actually more important that we be able to work with others to be able to improve this foundation. Like, you know, when we get to those giant ships with all those layers of programs, like we want to make sure that the foundations are really good. And I think like that's an opportunity that we have to like help make our tools better, like blacksmiths build their tools up from scratch and get better and better over their lifetime. And when an apprentice goes out, he often goes with his own tools, but he takes some of his master's tools. And I think that's like some element of like, we're all going to be programmers at some point. We're all gonna to touch these big complex computer systems. And if we don't understand how they work, we have no way to control them. Like they're just magic fairies inside of our phones. And I think we need to actually get to that point where we understand what's going on. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, for me, um, you know, when I first installed Linux on, uh, you know, my uh, uh, computer in my, in my dorm room, I think there's this, this feeling of control, um, you know, because it's very, it's very flexible. I own it. I can change it. I can go read about it. I can be part of the community. Um, so I think, I think that element of control is, is, is very empowering. Um, and also the community and the fact that you can learn from the community. Uh, you can contribute to the community. As an engineer, that feels, uh, that feels very natural. <laughs> so uh, I think those, those have been the two reasons for me. Um, but you asked what the users think, and I think we have a lot of users here. So we should ask the audience. Um, you know, yeah. any, any users want to mention why it's important to them for, to, work on an open, to be using an open source software project? Yeah, you're going to have to shout. Um, maybe one point that I saw, especially in the development of Kubernetes and uh, what's going on with, uh, within that area, is I, I can see what the next step will be. Um, I just saw that with the role-based access control. I knew uh, that that feature was in alpha before. Now it's going to get stabilized and it's going to uh, move forward. And it allows me, um, um, firstly, to contribute to the development of that, and, and secondly, to see what can I expect for the future. And this is, for me, one of the most important points when it comes to, to open source development and using an open source tool. And also the freedom to do whatever I want with it. Yes, that's a great point. And, and as a product manager, I mirror that. You know, it becomes one community. Your users, your contributors, the people that are involved becomes one community. And I think we, we have a virtuous cycle because I want to know what users want to do. And that's right. what I want to build. Any questions from the audience or any other points? Yes. I have a question for the panel here. So. Um, I work for uh, Juniper Networks, and we have an open, uh, open source product called Open Contrail. But with our experience with communities like OpenStack, one thing um, I've realized is as the communities grow larger, there is the tendency to feel like you're working for the community rather than looking after what the end users need. So how do you um, balance between that? Like, you know, that ultimately the end user is what is who you're serving. Um, and so that's an interesting point. I'd like to answer that first, if I may. Um, this is an opportunity for me to talk about the difference between CNCF and OpenStack. Um, OpenStack is an attempt to build an extremely ambitious architecture for an extremely complex and important problem, which is the infrastructure automation problem at scale. And to do that, what it has done is it has created a, um, in my opinion, slightly monolithic way of looking at the world, which has created, on the plus side, a quite homogeneous community, which is very big, but on the minus side, um, a lot of interlock between the different projects, which means that um, the effect that you describe happens. I believe that a, a solution, maybe not the, the only solution, but a solution is to make sure that there are more smaller projects moving at their own speeds. Well, when I say smaller, I mean smaller than OpenStack. Um, within the CNCF, there is one huge project, Kubernetes, which is moving incredibly fast. But there are also smaller projects like Prometheus and Fluentd and gRPC, and they're all right size. 
And within each one of those communities, you don't quite have the sense that you describe because things are scaled down to the problem at hand. There isn't the sense of having to look over your shoulder and worry about what the other project is doing because you're part of some huge homogeneous vision of some unknown person. Yeah, there's also uh, the governance structure. Uh, you know, I think if you have uh, a foundation uh, that is, um, you know, very heavy in its governance, then uh, I think what you're saying can happen, where uh, you're working for the community rather than the users. Um, whereas, uh, at least so far, Kubernetes uh, has been very independent uh, in terms of uh, the technology that and, and the roadmap. It's largely driven by the contributors who are also the users, uh, some of whom are also the users, or they are uh, providing to the users. So that, I think if you have a governance structure that's too bureaucratic, <laughs> that, that, can be a, that can be a killer. So I was gonna say, and I hope I'm not stealing uh, Brandon's thing, because that would feel rude. Um, I was- uh, It would mean great minds think alike. <laughs> uh, one of the things we've talked a lot about in Kubernetes is making it easier to break it up in terms of like there's been discussions about what's core and what's not core and extensibility and all of those are really an attempt to say there's a fundamental challenge that's really really coherent but it if you grow too large you run into the, all of the challenges that people have described which is you have to have some big architectural vision and i honestly think that the most successful path for the kubernetes community is actually you know, to make the trade-off and say that there is no big, grand, magic architectural vision that you know, is gonna carry us 30 years in the future. But instead to step back and say, we've done one thing really well, let's make that be stable and, and secure and reliable, and then let's let a thousand flowers bloom. And I think, you know, this is always the tension, is like you could go build things the Kubernetes way, but I think that leads to a lot of missed opportunities to change the mindset, and I think, you know, my cynicism in this is that no two pieces of software ever work what, like perfectly together, right? Nobody is like, gosh, look at the problems we were having with uh, presentations this morning. But it ultimately comes down to, you can make things work, you make things work well enough to get actual value out of them as a user, as a company, as, a, as a, someone developing applications. And I think, I think we should be willing to trade this perfect integrated vision for the flexibility to to bring new ideas in and continually be changing because that'll be a constant. So as users, um, on, how do we, oh, sorry. I was just as users, how do we know which one of the projects are stable and that we, we should actually integrate these into our infrastructure so we can use them? What's the, what's the thing we should be watching in the community to make sure that not only we know they're mature and it was good to see the, the, the beta, the alpha and the stable, but then the interdependencies between those projects. Who, on the, who in CNCF is responsible for making sure that those interdependencies are gonna be stable and that it isn't gonna fall apart? Yeah, so um, really that comes down to a lot of the decisions that happen inside of the Kubernetes project. So you'll see um, a lot of testing happening <laughs> inside of the Kubernetes project around um, just every single release. Um, and so going back to kind of what Clayton was talking about. Um, for some of the foundational components, like they're pretty like strong opinions and there's kind of like a reasonable set of defaults um, that come out of the project. And those are sort of the things that should, for the most part, end up in people's environments. Um, but we are kind of building a Lego-y system. And so uh, inevitably it will be up to, um, you know, taste and testing um, of individuals setups to ensure that it's, um, it's good and complete. Yeah, I, I, the, the Lego analogy I think is a good one. Um, there are parts and pieces, each of which is well tested and stable, but they can fit together to create different toys, completely different toys, um, and they're for different environments. And that's part of the architecture. I think the base architecture of Kubernetes is very modular. Uh, it's meant to be something that can be customized or say a bare metal or a different cloud provider. Um, and so there, there will be these distrib dis different distributions that cater to a particular uh, environment. And then you go with and you trust you know, the, the, the distributor. Paul? To take things back to how can we best keep users' interests in mind, uh, I think one thing that's extremely important is to have a good path for users to become developers and other types of contributors because 
users tend to know what they want. Like they, they're, they're using something to accomplish a goal. And if we can give them tools to help the project, help them accomplish their goals by contributing, that's, that's really powerful, right? And sets up like a positive feedback loop. I'd like to try as well. Yeah, I think that's an important point and touched on the issue earlier around the importance of open source. So trust is fundamental to the relationship between a user and their software. And if you don't trust a piece of software, you soon stop using it. And there have been different approaches to building trust in software over the last years. But I think right now we have a really good model which mixes you know, distributors, vendors, communities, foundations, and channels like Slack and GitHub, where people can interact one-on-one -on -one with uh, you know, leaders from the uh, development teams, for example. I think all of this is crucial to building trust at the project level. And then different organizations can play a further role to strengthen that trust. So for example, the CNCF can publish information about what works with what. And at the moment, pretty much everything works with pretty much everything within the CNCF because the projects are sort of fairly different. But I think in the future, that's going to become much more important. You probably noticed that recently, uh, ContainerD and RKT were put up for the CNCF. And it will be very important for end users to understand which containers work with Kubernetes, for example, at any given moment. And that might be a changing thing. So you know, versions will get updated. People will need to be told. And doing that through a neutral foundation-like channel is a sensible thing to do. On top of that, there are, there's more. I mean, I think there's a crucial role for distributions and vendors. So for example, OpenShift, I believe, is 100% open source, but it's an assembly of multiple projects. So that comes with it, trust that somebody, these two guys and others, have made an effort to make the pieces work together. Then you have things like Tectonic, which is a commercial distribution, but also providing you that guarantee. So these are all different ways in which trust can be built up. And it ultimately comes down to a relationship between you, the user, and who's providing you with the software. And, and to go back to upstream, you can always use upstream <laughs> or create your own uh, mix and match different components that uh, suit your environment. And I, th I think the other thing that, that shows that, that the projects are thinking about users is a lot of the work that's going into cloud interoperability right now. So for example, the service broker API work is, I think, an example of that. So and I would make a, like, this is a kind of a stretch analogy, so you have to bear with me. I sometimes go for very torturous analogies. But like the spaceship? Yeah, that is exactly like that. <laughs> um, I think in this case, the, um, I would, I'd like to see Kubernetes become the Microsoft Excel of distributed systems, which is, it is not there to ensure that you can do 10 billion rows and all of that. But people do it anyway, and they get value out of it, and it's useful. And everybody can kind of approach it, everybody can approach it from the beginning and say, I know how to take this piece and put it together with these other pieces and actually run distributed systems successfully. And I think, you know, there's lots of different aspects of distributed systems, feedback loops and all this. But like that formula is an incredibly powerful thing. We need an equivalent formula for Kubernetes to let you run these things, keep them together, and you know, get something out of it at the end, get a result out of it, which is your applications keep running. That so was I a stretch, I know. All I can think about now is Clippy with a K. That's right. <laughs> Clippy, would you like distributed Macros. systems with that? It looks like you're so trying to build a distributed system. <laughs> <laughs> have you considered not? <coughs> I think we have time for like two more questions from the audience. So um, maybe one question when it comes down to uh, what you can expect from, from open source and from stability. I believe what we should really think about is um, what can we be sure that an API or a component in Kubernetes solves? Uh, because this is one of the things that I've ran into recently is um, persistent volumes having the wrong users configured when I start them up. And then I need to run uh, as a root user and reconfigure that. And there were some bug reports for that. Um, but all of those were closed and said, this is not what a persistent volume should solve. This needs to be solved at <coughs> another level. And I can rely on that and I can accept that and I can be sure that this is gonna stay for the future and it's not gonna change. And this is one of the things that I believe is most important for stability and interoperability in the future. Thanks. That's Paul's Any... fault, actually. Sorry, so. dude. <laughs> Paul, Paul was responsible for that and, and you know. So, so here's your chance to like buy him one of the free beers at the end of the day and, and try to change his mind. <coughs> See me after this <laughs> for a beer ticket. And I was going to say like the sense of humility that people in Kubernetes need to have is like what 
I mean, like the, one of the things that's made Kubernetes specifically successful has been a bunch of people trying their best to take all the really important lessons that they learned and like come up with the simplest possible thing that could actually work that doesn't overshoot and it doesn't always get it right. Like there's lots of little things and that's just the way software is. Like those layers of all that software going back in time that are just gonna be built up forever. Like we just wanna try to do our best to take the, that feedback and be reactive. Like if Kubernetes has to change, Kubernetes will change. And I think that's the best part about open source is that there's always an opportunity for that. Yeah, I, I think I would say that the, there's a very high level of conscientiousness um, you know, amongst the engineering uh, and, and technical team behind the project. Uh, we take the responsibility very seriously. Uh, in terms of structural, uh, you know, that we have the alpha, beta, and stable labels for different um, uh, features. The alpha uh, indicates that the API isn't yet uh, pinned down and there could be changes, and so that's a, uh, you know, use at your own risk type of thing. Uh, beta gets towards, uh, you know, once, once uh, something goes beta, then, you know, it's, the, it's not gonna change, and then stable is, it's been, you know, it's been through the, uh, through the washer. Um, so we try to do that um, and provide that kind of label uh, to help along. So I, I think that uh, there, one thing that we'll probably find as we refine the Kubernetes APIs, for example, is that the, the contract matters to the extent that it actually specifies all the things that are in the contract. So, uh, I, I, th I think that we'll find that the, the more specific the contract is, the easier it is to, one, make it coherent for users about what they can expect, and two, ensure that when we say an API is stable, that we can actually test it because the contract is well-defined. Like, it's, it's very easy to make like a new API resource and say these are the fields, right? But the interplay of those fields in a particular resource with another feature may not be defined in a stable API. Where does that leave you, right? So there's probably additional specificity that will improve things for everybody, both like as a user and then also as a develop developer. That's good feedback. All right, before thank we, you. oh, go ahead. No, I was just, thank you for the feedback. Before we close, I have one more exercise for all of you. Um, so you're gonna go to lunch, and I'm sure Dan has a few words to say to you before you do that. Um, but before we say thanks to the panel, I'd like you to turn to the person next to you and tell them what kind of conversation you are going to try to have at lunch. Um, so who are you going to try to find? What do you want to talk about? So turn to the person next to you and tell them what you're going to talk about at lunch. The spice must flow, Brendan. That's what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> All right, so you actually have to save the conversation for lunch, but that's awesome. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to close the panel here. Oh, everybody, awesome conversations. Um, but I want to close the panel by everybody saying their name one time so you know who they are again. Um, so I'm going to have everyone on the panel just stand up tall and say your name so that if anyone in the audience wants to find you, they know who you are. Aparna Sena. You can find me outside uh, during lunch. I don't know. Brandon Phillips. Paul Mori. Do you see me about that drink ticket? <laughs> Alexis Richardson and uh, Clayton Coleman. Right, thank you very much.